Hi everyone, uh, Nathan Watt here from Watson & Watt. Um, tonight we've got Tax in 10 at the UQ Young, Young Alumni event. Um, and I'm just going to run through a brief um, synopsis of tonight's uh, presentation for those who can't make it. So tonight we're going to cover off on six different areas. Um, one, what the tax office has on you. Uh, we're going to put on our tinfoil hats and, and have a, a round up of that. Some tax system basics, some very, very basics of that and how the marginal tax system works. Uh, deduction basics and what you can and can't claim. Um, some deductions you might be missing and some record keeping tips to make tax time easy. And lastly, some tax minimisation strategies that we'll go through very briefly, um, just so you can think about some proactive strategies rather than junior strategies. So, all right, tinfoil hats on, here we go. Uh, what the ATO knows about you is broadly lumped into four categories, well, I've lumped it into four categories. One is the pre-field information, uh, second, tax return labels, the data matching, and other government agencies. So, pre-fill is basically when you look into your MyTax um, and you do it online, there'll be a whole bunch of information already there. So, your employer will have uploaded your payment summaries, the bank will give you the interest information, things like that. That's referred to as pre-fill information. As tax agents, we get the same data, we just get it in a different, slightly different format. But it broadly covers all of the income categories that you can, you can get. Uh, so you can run through those, salary and wages, interest, dividends, managed funds, uh, contractor income, that's only for some in industries, uh, ones with high levels of cash transactions, a lot of contractors, a lot of building, cleaning, things like that. Um, employee share schemes, so if you work for startups or anybody who has big companies who have short employee share schemes, the data will already be there, which makes it a lot easier these days. Sale of property and sale of shares, um, property comes from the titles office, so if you sell a property, um, the ATO will know about it and they'll be looking for a capital gain in your tax return. Sale of shares will come from the share registries. Again, if you sell shares, they'll be expecting some sort of capital gain transaction in your tax return. The private health um, insurers, insurance funds, they send the data across. Um, your health balances, nobody's forgotten about those. Uh, prior year data, which isn't that useful, but it just sort of says uh, last year you claimed $1,300 at D5. Um, not really that insightful. And lastly is your spouse information, so who your spouse is, their date of birth, all that sort of stuff. Uh, tax return labels. Um, this really only dawned on me a few years ago uh, when big data started being a, a thing. Um, all the data in your tax return is you know, a label, which means it can be reported on. So if we look at the information they have got on you, what they can do is apply their AI and their machine learning to start building a profile about you and your industry, where you live and all that sort of stuff to start looking for the outliers. So what they're looking for here is um, you're a lawyer in Brisbane, are you in line with other lawyers in Brisbane in terms of your earnings and your deductions? So they look at the current year profile of that, so this year you went $80,000 and you had $3,000 of expenses, is that about what other lawyers in that category earned and, and spent? If not, they'll send you a dirty letter saying, hey, please check your, your tax, tax um, return to make sure you haven't overclaimed anything. Um, the second one, previous years, they'll look at your earnings and your deductions over time to start building a profile about who you are as a taxpayer. So if they can see the income starting to rise and your deductions are in line with everybody else's, they'll start looking at where you're living and your cars you're driving, all that sort of stuff as they get information from the share registries and the titles office to start piecing together a picture of who you are as a taxpayer. So when something does happen that's out of the ordinary, so one year you have zero tax because you've gone overseas and lived over there for 12 months. They might send you a letter saying, please explain. So those sorts of things all start paying the picture of who you are as a taxpayer. The last one uh, is unexplained wealth. Um, and that really comes down to that profile of the, the taxpayer. So if you live in a $2 million house that's in your name, but you're only earning $30,000 in the tax return, they're going to be starting asking questions about, well, how can you afford this lifestyle? And that all goes back to the tax return labels and the, and the data matching. Uh, data matching is two ways. Um, not all employers are um, as diligent as everybody else, so sometimes you'll have done your tax return and put in your payment summary, but the employer hasn't submitted the information yet. So when they do, they'll be backtracking from what the employees have put into their tax return and going back to the employer's records and their vouchers to make sure that it reconciles back and forth. So it's a two-way street with that sort of stuff. Uh, data matching, it's sort of covered off in the pre-fill, there's a whole bunch of areas where they get the information from. Uh, the first lot there are from the, the pre-fill. The last one's down, so from credit cards down, uh, different ones. So credit cards, this isn't for pe uh, personal people, individuals, it's for businesses. So they're looking for merchant facilities. So if you're running a cafe, 
um, they'll look at your merchant facility and work out how much income you've earned from that during the year. If that's the only income you've put into your tax return for the year, they're going to be asking questions about, well, did you make any cash sales at all? That's what they're looking for. Online selling, they're looking at PayPal and, and places like that, Stripe, ride sourcing, so that's Uber drivers, they get all the information from Uber to make sure that you're declaring it against your ABN. And the motor vehicles, um, any vehicle over $10,000 is reported to the ATO, and that's to get companies and people selling vehicles that have been used for business purposes, but they haven't done a taxable adjustment when they've sold it. The last ones, uh, government agencies they match for are Centrelink, Child Support, um, Home Office, Home Affairs, which is visas, so people overstaying their visa, um, the Office of Home Affairs can't find them, so they look up the, the tax return addresses and places like that to find you. Immigration is more about when you enter and leave Australia, and what they're trying to work out is, are you an Australian tax resident, uh, which is different from citizenship. And the same with the Electoral Commission, that's about which um, house have you put on the electoral roll, so is that your main residence? Have you got multiple properties? Which one are you going to claim the exemption on? And land titles, uh, same sort of thing. Have you sold a property? Is it your main residence? Uh, tax system basics, I'll run through this very quickly. So we have a marginal tax rate in Australia. Um, they tinker with them all the time. Uh, this year, it's the brackets are 37 to 90,000 is the main bracket there. Um, but I wanted to just point on that the marginal tax rate isn't your effective tax rate. So if you look down the bottom, there's a, a calculation there, $90,000 of income. You pay 20,797 of, inco of income tax, which gives you a tax rate of 23%. But your marginal tax rate is 32 and a half, excluding the Medicare levy. So if every dollar more that you earn, you're going to pay 32 and a half cents in tax, but your average tax rate is still only 23. So that comes, becomes important when we're doing tax planning, when you've got companies and trusts and things like that, because we can filter and we can plan around the actual average tax rate for the group as a whole. Um, this is how deductions work. One of the things I hear a lot with people is, I'll just write that off on tax. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me because deductions are only good as, as good as your tax rate. And this example goes through that. I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen there, but um, if you've got $90,500 $90, of income, you pay $22,792 in tax. If you have $1,500 of expenses there, you'll pay $540 less tax, but you'll still be out of pocket $960. So yes, you'll be able to write those expenses off on tax, but you're still out of pocket 64%. So, just because you get a tax deduction for it doesn't mean you're going to be any better off because you've already spent the cash. Uh, deduction basics, this just points to the fact that there's different deductions available for businesses than there are for individuals. The individuals have a lot tighter regime on what they can claim and the nexus between income and expenses is a lot, is a lot tighter. Um, businesses have a broader definition of what can be claimed because it's necessarily incurred in carrying on a business. So we'll have a look at the deductions in a uh, individual tax return, they're basically in the D section, when you go through your, your My Tax, it'll be D1 through to D15 I think it is, um, vehicles and travel expenses, these are broken into two different labels, one's for motor vehicles, one's for everything else that isn't a motor vehicle, so motorcycles, um, flights, all that sort of stuff. Clothing and laundry, um, you would have heard recently they've cracked down on this one, we'll, we'll be cracking down on this one, you can only claim an deduction here if you have a compulsory uniform, a protective uniform, or a non-compulsory work uniform. Now they're very, um, very detailed descriptions of what they are. So I wear a suit to work, I can't claim any laundry for that. I can't claim the cost of the cost of the suit, I can't claim the laundry, I can't claim any dry cleaning. If I was a chef and I had chef pants, the black and white checks, I can claim that under the um, those rules because that's unique to being chefs. If I had a uniform with the, the logo on it, then I can claim that as well. So you need to be really careful about what you can and can't claim there. The $150 limit that, that, that's on there just means you don't need to keep receipts, but you need to be able to claim, you need to be able to substantiate what your claim is. Donations are only deductible if you're paid a deductible gift recipient. Um, that's a long way of saying on the bottom of the receipt there should be donate, donations over $2 are tax deductible. If that isn't there, then you can go and look it up on the ABN uh, lookup site but in broad, they should be at the bottom of the, of the receipt. If it's not there, you can't claim a tax deduction. Home office expenses gets missed a fair bit. Um, you can claim a deduction for work at home if you have a home office. And it needs to be a dedicated space, and I'll run through that in the next slide. Interest and dividend expenses. So if you've got a margin loan for your shares, you can claim the interest income, interest expense on the margin loan. 
self-education expenses. Um, again, this one's a little bit hard to get through sometimes because the, the definition really comes down to is it incurred for your current role, not for getting a new role or a promotion. Tools and equipment, um, again, that's that's pretty good. Pretty good one. Uh, it's pretty easy to get through. You've got a laptop. You got you're a plumber. You need some tools. That's that's pretty self-explanatory. And there's a whole bunch of others, income protection, um, all that sort of stuff as well down the bottom. If you do have um, a specific occupation, you can look up that link. There are examples of what you can and can't claim uh, for each, for each um, or for a lot of the industry. So have a look at that if you're not quite sure. So these are the ones you might, might be missing. Um, home office expenses, as I said, um, there's two ways you can claim this. One is the cents per hour, and that is at six, 45 cents per hour that you work from home. So if you work from home two days a week, and you have a dedicated space, so you've converted the bedroom into an office and you don't use it for anything else, then you can claim 45 cents per hour that you work there. So 16 hours a week, 45 cents, 48 hours, 48 weeks a year, gives you, you know, 300 bucks, whatever it is. Uh, the other method is the percent of actual cost. So you work out the, the square meter of that, um, that room, that home office, divided by the total square meter of your house, and then you can claim your electricity, your gas, um, all that sort of stuff. If you're running a business from home, you can claim part of the rent, but if you're actually just working from home at a job that requires you to go to work, then you can't claim the rent or the mortgage repayments. Um, but that's one that gets missed a fair bit, and it can be a couple hundred dollars a year that you can, you can um, get back. Depreciation, again, on the home office, if you've got a desk, you've got a chair, you've got all that sort of stuff, you can depreciate the cost of that over um, several years, um, and that might get missed if you haven't thought about it. The other one's books, periodicals, and digital subscriptions. So you used to go to the library and get the Journal of Finance and things like that. If you subscribe to any journals or textbooks or resource books that are specific for your job and you need them, technical manuals, you can depreciate the cost of your library. Uh, income protection, insurance premiums. A lot of people get paid or pay these through their super fund, but if you pay them personally, they are a tax deduction. Um, they go down in the weird spot, down in other deductions. And as I said, donations, people throw $5 in the, in the tin or they, you know, they might get a raffle or whatever and they, and they donate some money. Um, if you haven't got a receipt, you can't claim it. And if you have used a raffle, you can't claim that either. It just needs to be a donation. So money for nothing, basically. You're putting money in the jar and they need to give you a receipt for that. Record keeping, um, use the keep it simple, stupid method. Um, there is an app called the HA My Deductions app. Depending on how thick your tinfoil hat is, you may or may not want to tell the ATO what your expenses are um, throughout the year. But some other methods are put a folder in your email and just drag and drop it into there, into Dropbox or Google Drive or wherever it is, or you create a folder on your phone and you just take photos of everything and you just keep taking it there and once you've done all that, you put all your receipts in one spot. Excel um, is great, it's easy for me when people send me Excel files, but you still need to keep your receipts and your invoices. There are software programs like Receipt Bank and there's HubDoc and a few others um, if you really want to um, get on a technology bandwagon, but it'll probably cost you more than it's worth. And NetBank, uh, like ComBank and things like that, have expense categorizations now. So you can actually filter a lot of that inside NetBank, but again, you still need to keep your receipts and invoices. So make it easy, um, avoid paper at all costs because it's just going to cost you money if you actually do go to a tax agent. And keeping it all in one spot is going to make sure you don't miss any deductions. Lastly, some tax strategies. Um, I'm not sure if you can see these, but basically, if you're earning um, any money, really, uh, it doesn't matter of your income level, as long as you're paying some tax, um, you can get some tax um, minimization through salary sacrifice. Um, usually, these don't uh, work out too well, unless you're working for a hospital or somewhere like that, because of the way the bridge benefit tax system works. So what we're looking for is exempt benefits and um, specific benefits. benefits. So this one's a motor vehicle that's worth $30,000 with 100% private use. So normally you can't claim private things on tax, um, but with the salary sacrifice under a motor vehicle arrangement, um, the way the calculations work, there's actually two different calculations and playing with those rules, um, you can actually get a tax benefit. So on $87,000 income, $87, income here, you can actually save about $1,800 a year by salary sacrificing your private car, um, your $30,000 private car. So it's something to think, keep in mind, if you do need a new car, or you're going to buy a new car, then you can save some money. But again, as I said before in the deduction thing, don't buy a car to try and save tax, because that doesn't work. But if you're going to buy a car, there are ways that we can package it um, to make it, make it better off. 
Second one is professional memberships. Um, this is under the otherwise deductible rule, so anything that would be normally deductible, you can uh, salary sacrifice without fringe benefits tax. This one hasn't got uh, too much of a benefit there. You're basically just saving some GST. But if you had a lot of these expenses, there could be some benefits there. And if a $65 benefit on this one, you wouldn't bother, but for a few others, you might. If you have a got a rental property, um, again, this is an otherwise deductible um, fringe benefit. So you can save, you know, on this one, there's $1,300 benefit there by salary sacrificing your rental property expenses. So the, I guess the, the theme of that is, there are ways we can save some tax. None of them will take your tax to zero, but all those sort of add up. So if you did those two there, you would have saved about three and a half thousand dollars worth of tax on an eighty-seven thousand dollar income. So it's not to be sneezed at, um, but it does need some planning, and you need to do it in advance. It can't be done in arrears. So that's it for the tax in ten. I hope you enjoyed it.